Um, there's a list of names here. These are just people who've been working on um, uh, the project, getting the data together, analysing it, sorting it, working out what's happening more recently. But this has been going for a very long time uh, and uh, started off as Rod Dyer's um, master's project. So a little bit about what I'm going to cover today. I'll start off with um, what we know about the incidence of fire in Grey Savannas and how that varies spatially. Why does fire matter? And then get into the guts of what we can learn from our long-term fire trial at Kidman Springs and then try and bring that all together for lessons for optimal fire management in a carbon economy in northern Savannas. So why is fire such a hot topic? We know that fire incidence has changed since settlement, but it's changed in different ways spatially across the northern savannas. We've looked at this in detail in the Victoria River District. Um, the Victoria River District is a good place for a case study of fire incidence. It's got a good range of different land uses, defence, indigenous, indigenous pastoral, national park, and then that big blue sea of pastoral leases there. In the north, it's 1,000 mil rainfall. Down to the south, it's 500 mil. So it actually corresponds to um, what the new Savannah burning methodology for the 600 to 1,000 mil um, zone will be useful for when that's developed. So what did we find? In the Victoria River District, um, we used NAFI data, AVHHR 97 to 2010. Over a 14 year period, the y-axis shows the um, proportion of area burnt and along the bottom axis, we have the number of fires that occurred in that 14 year period, from zero through to more than um, four burns. So what we can see is those blue lines were um, pastoral and indigenous pastoral land use. And you can see they're most likely to have had no fires or only one fire during that 40, 14 year period. Conversely, the green defense national park land uses were more likely to have more than four burns and indigenous um, more than three to four burns during this time. But even within a land use, how frequently an area burns does vary with land type. What we have here is basically the same graph as before but we've broken it down by land use and then we've looked at fire incidents for different land types. And we divided into three broad land type categories. The good good Productivity um, is the black soils, moderate productivity, the black line is kind of your red earths, and then the poor productivity land types, which are kind of skeletal or sandy deserts, and they're often not used for grazing at all, even if they are on pastoral leases. And what we find is, over on the left for your defence and your park land uses, all these lines are overlapping, which means that all the different land types pretty much had the same fire frequency. But when you get to pastoral and to a lesser extent indigenous pastoral, different land types had different frequency of fire occurring. So you can see, for example, the pastoral land use, the black soils, the green line, were most more likely than any other land type there to have had no fire. The moderate productivity land types burnt more frequently than black soils but the least productive land types burnt just as often on pastoral land as they do on anywhere else, um, defence, park, etc., in the Victoria River District. So what we find is that the more productive a land type, the least likely it's burning on pastoral or grazed areas. The main reason we tend to talk about why fire is important is how um, woody cover has changed in grazed savannas, where you've had a decrease in fire frequency. Sometimes that's... Um, led to increase in woody cover. So we talk about how fire might be used to increase, um, to manage that woody cover that's occurred. Of course, if you're off the grazed estate, you might have such a high fire frequency that you've actually had a decline in woody cover, and then you might be talking about reducing um, your fire frequency to actually help those fire sensitive species. But fire is also used for grazing management. Uh, fire is often used to remove rank pasture, so you get a higher quality um, pasture growing back, it increases live weight gains. Uh, you can use fire because animals prefer burnt areas to move where animals are moving in a paddock. You might burn fire away from water to get them to graze there. Or you might burn the whole paddock to kind of reset those gra patch grazes, grazing that's been occurring. Often though, when we're talking about fire, we're talking about mitigating wildfire. 
um, preventing fires coming in from neighbouring areas that burn more frequently, protecting your grazing resource, protecting your infrastructure, people and safety. Given that we think that fire frequency may need to occur more frequently in grazed lands, this is where our long-term fire experiment can give us some uh, useful lessons. So our experiment is on Kidman Springs Research Station. It started in 93, 20 years this year. We've got um, the same lot of treatments on a black cracking clay, a very productive soil type, and also on a red earth and moderate productivity land type. We've looked at the impact of different season of fires, so early in June or late in October, um, dry season fires. And we've also, for each of those seasons of fire, we've looked at different fire frequency. So burning every two, four, six years, or a control unburnt comparison. This is what our red soil site looks from the ground, and this is an aerial photo taken in June this year. You can see the plots are 160 metres by 160 metres. Each of the treatments is replicated twice. And this is the black soil, and again an aerial photo from June this year. And you can see along this top line of treatments, the unburnt controls have a lot more cover than these more frequently burnt ones in the middle there. So it's visible even just from the air. So DPI has been monitoring these sites since 93. We've been collecting um, pasture data and botanelles across the site, looking at ground cover, yield, pasture composition, and more sporadically, we've been measuring woody cover. We've also been inviting other people to come in and measure things that they're expert in, like biodiversity, soil organic carbon, mites, uh, above ground carbon. But today, we're going to focus on what DPI has been looking at at the site. So this is woody cover. Uh, in 2009, we measured canopy cover along our botanelle transects. On the left, you've got the red soil site, and on the right, you've got the black soil site. On the y-axis, we have canopy cover. On the x-axis, we've got the fire frequency, control, no burn versus six yearly, four yearly, or two yearly burns. The blue line is early season fires, and the red line is late season fires. And what you can see is, regardless of fire interval, um, early season fires didn't have much of an impact on woody cover and red soil. If you wanted to impact woody cover on red soil, you needed to have late season fires and you need to have them at least every four years. On the black soil, season of fire didn't actually make much difference. You've got more fuel there generally and the woody plants tend to be shorter, so any season of fire was enough to manage woody cover. I will just note um, that uh, density of cover, like um, they found at Wambiena, isn't actually influenced much by uh, fire, it's more the structure that you can influence. So uh, a lovely uh, pasture graph here for you. Mick told me that my talk had to be better than the one in Kananara, so I thought, well, what could he mean? I mean, how can it get better? But I thought, he definitely wants another data point, so I've got that there for you today from June this year. So what we have here is on the black soil, um, total pasture yield. On the y-axis, just the total amount of um, pasture in kilograms per hectare. The top graph is the early season burnt plots. The bottom graph is the late season burnt plots. Then we have the black line is the controls. The green line is the six yearly burns. Blue line is the four yearly burns. And the red line is the two yearly burns. Generally speaking, pasture yields, not surprisingly, fluctuated with seasons up and down. There wasn't a very large impact of fire, but there did tend to be slightly less total pasture yield on um, burnt sites, and this isn't surprising because you're not getting the carryover after a fire, and also sometimes you're getting a bit of extra preferential grazing on recently burnt sites, so you're getting that combined effect. It was the same story for the red soil, so I'm not showing it, but I will point out this very dry year in 2003, and that actually caused quite a shift in species composition across the site. So in terms of composition, this is the red soil site. It started off as an arid short grass. Um, it was about 60 to 80% brachyacne and eniopogon at the beginning. And that trundled along pretty much the same until in 2003 it crashed. We had kind of a semi-failed wet. And it uh, didn't really change much thereafter, although perhaps a little bit um, in those more frequently early burnt sites, it's starting to come back again. At the same time, we had this massive increase in black spear grass across the site. At the beginning, there was hardly any black spear grass, very low yields. Um, 
but by the end it's uh, dominating all treatments, regardless of whether or not there was any fire or, no, or um, no fire at all. And this is actually interesting because it has been hypothesised that the increase in black speargrass, it's actually been observed across the VRD and Kimberley regions, perhaps was as a result of higher fire frequency. But we find here that even without fire, black speargrass has increased. I think it's actually probably a response to the higher rainfall that we're getting, which has tended to shift it into a niche that's suitable for black speargrass. But that's uh, purely speculative. Um, you can see here that in contrast to um, fire promoting black spear grass, uh, on these frequently burnt, uh, early burnt plots, it actually tended to suppress the proportion of spear grass in the site. And I th um, it's probably a bit of a fire grazing interaction happening here. On the black soil site, um, this is a ribbon grass, bluegrass site. Um, Although ribbon and bluegrass have declined in yield through time, I haven't shown that that's a stocking rate rather than a fire effect. Um, what you can see here is after the very dry year in 2003, there was an increase in the unpalatable short-lived perennial Aristotle latifolia across the site, um, although this increase was suppressed on, um, on burnt sites. So for both um, the red soil and the black soil, we're getting this increase in this unpalatable perennial grass, but that increase tends to be dampened where it's um, burnt more often. We think that's an, a fire grazing interaction rather than a fire response so much. Because cattle are, um, these sites are open to grazing and cattle can preferentially graze wherever they want and they do prefer burnt areas. On the red soil site, we tended to get a high proportion of forbs um, where we had fire. And similarly, on the black soil site, we tend to get a high proportion of native legumes. These are native pastures, no improved pastures here yet. Um, so the species here that most increased was unpalatable um, Fleming's bush, Flamingia. And on the red soil, it was unpalatable bachelor's buttons, um, Gumfrina canescens. So in summary, in terms of what happened on our fire sites, on the red soil, two yearly and early fire tended to slightly suppress perennial grass yield, promoted annuals and forbs. You needed at least four yearly and late fire to manage woody cover on the red soil. On the black soil, burning every two years or early burns tended to reduce total yield and perennial grass yield, increase annual grass yield and the proportion of legumes. On the black soil, early or late four yearly fires was enough to manage woody cover. So what does this tell us about what is optimal fire frequency? We've known now that pastoral land is typically burnt less frequently than non-commercial land uses in the region, but this does vary by land type. So for the most productive grazing land on pastoral land, 89% of it was burnt less than the four yearly fire that our study suggests is best to manage woody cover. Similarly, for the moderate productivity land type, 73% of that in the VRD is burnt less frequently than the four yearly that we would recommend. What about timing of fire? Off the pastoral estate, there's been a lot of work um, trying to reduce the frequency of damaging late season fires uh, because they're bad for biodiversity, they um, are bad for greenhouse gas emissions. Interestingly, when we applied early fire, as is recommended off the pastoral estate in the graze context, it did tend to cause a decline in pasture composition. Four yearly late fires were best for red soils because of the effects on woody cover and composi pasture composition. Well, now, although early fire was enough to manage woody cover on the black soils, again, you would need to be managing that post-fire grazing to prevent pasture decline. So what does this mean for opportunities for carbon farming? The more productive pastoral lands need more fire to manage woody thickening. Therefore, there's no um, potential for carbon farming by, um, by reducing your fire frequency. There isn't much fire. You actually need to add more fire. You'll be looking at reducing potentially your above ground carbon storage if you're decreasing your woody cover. So you won't be doing any carbon farming in that way here. But even on pastoral land, there's often areas that are not very productive. In fact, they're often not grazed. They might be spinifex escarpments, Tenemai Desert. And here, there may be potential opportunity for producers to reduce fire frequency and the associated greenhouse gas emissions with biodiversity benefits. The, um, 
Savannah burning methodology for the 600 to 1,000 mil um, zone is actually being developed as we speak, so there's potential there. So Kidman Springs, we think our fire experiment has provided important insights into the use of fire in grazed savannas. We think it is the long term and particularly the grazed nature of this experiment which has been very important for giving us insights that's relevant to the pastoral zone. It also makes it unique in any fire experiment in Northern Australia. We've been able to find out things here that we wouldn't have known if we'd finished this experiment in 10 years or if the, fire, if the tri trials were not grazed. But we think there still is a lot more to be learnt from this site. For example, long-term carbon storage. The woody cover we've only measured sporadically, but we, do, uh, we are going to look into that. I'll talk about that more the next slide. We're also looking at uh, thinking about how spelling might be used with fire to um, prevent your pasture decline when you're putting fire in grazed systems. So we're looking to continue the study for now, but we are hoping to be able to fund it a bit to cover the not insignificant operating costs. We've started to work with CDU. Um, we have aerial photography of these plots over time, and we're working with them to digitally analyse them so we get a good understanding of how woody cover has changed across all treatments through time, which will help us to better model um, change in above ground carbon over time with fire. We're also looking to be fencing these plots to give us better post-fire grazing control, not to remove grazing from the system, but just to give us some flexibility about when these plots are burnt, um, are grazed before and after fire. Uh, lastly, I'd like to acknowledge MLA did used to fund this study up until about 2000 when it was Rod Dyer's master's thesis.